go. So um, first of all, thank you very much for the intro. Um, uh, my youngest son is part of the team build for 4199 with Jen Black. So I know a little bit about this, but definitely it's, it's a much smaller context than uh, FTC or FRC. Um, I shamelessly stole some of the uh, visuals uh, from, uh, well, stole probably is a strong word, but I'm reusing some of the visuals from the Scale Digital Framework website uh, with appropriate copyrights, of course. Um, so that's where the most of that comes. And I would strongly recommend anybody who is interested in the topic uh, and some practices and understanding of how the whole system works uh, to go explore the website. It's extremely rich in content and it's very helpful uh, with that guidance. So the first question always comes when we start talking about different methodologies uh, is uh, where to apply, which methodology fits where? It's one of the biggest questions. And in, in the context of today's conversation, I think, we're going to focus on the program management tools in general and how to organize the team and how this team executes. Um, and typically in, in the classical program management model, uh, we look at three variables which impact the ability of the team to deliver whatever the goals that they have, cost, time, and scope. And these are the three things, the three pillars of program management. And this is the typical balance that we have to strike to be able to, to deliver uh, whatever the goals are, whatever the content is with our time box. So what this shows uh, left and right, um, the decision on which methodology to apply to Timo's organization, heavily dependent on the, um, on the situation this team is in and their goals, right? So if we're talking about fixed scope and variable cost and time, and when we say cost um, in program management, that's resourcing. In other words, what's the size of the team, right? So if the team is fixed, the time is fixed as a time box and the scope, uh, sorry, is the, the team is, uh, we can add people, remove people and, and so on. If we can stretch the time and get another month or two, but we cannot deal with the scope. The scope is absolutely fixed and well-defined. That's one approach. And it's a very different situation when the scope is variable, or at least we have some flexibility with it, while the team size and the time box are fixed. So what you see on the left side is a more traditional mindset of waterfall, so-called. And what you see on the right side, that better fits the traditional, that's sort of the more modern agile mindset. Uh, the way, and please help me, and the way I understand the structure of your season, uh, it's the team is fixed and actually limited to the number of people you can pull in. The time is a box, meaning you have your state championship and then the uh, the worlds later on. But it's like you have to meet that time box. And the way your design is is something that you that's that's where you have the flexibility. Is that is that fair? Yeah, sounds about right. Fantastic. So. We'll focus on the right side. That's um, so, uh, and kind of there are some pros and cons. And uh, one of the big benefits is with a fixed team and the, and the, and the uh, stable team is the learning curve, of course. Uh, and once people kind of get into the swing of things, it's it's much easier to repeat and and, and evolve from there. Um, we can look at what so-called team velocity or the, the ability to, uh, to predict uh, certain operations, how long they're gonna take based on how long it took in the past uh, and keep looking at that information to help drive the, the predictions and time estimates. And uh, also the scope change typically because the, the whole infrastructure is built for variable scope, the, the change in scope or change in design, it's a natural flow. It's, it's not zero cost. It still takes some effort, but it's not, it's not free, but it's easier to manage, okay? So when we talk about Agile, uh, it's, especially at the team level, there are a few things which are um, essential. One is the team structure and how the team is organized. The second one is uh, the backlog or, 
all the elements, all the work that needs to happen uh, over the course of the project. And the third thing is the actual execution cadence. Um, the, uh, that cycle, the time book, that the time cycle, which uh, the team is using to, to deliver the content. So when we talk about the team structure, you can read the text and the, the, the team size and everything. The preference is to create a cross-functional team of, um, the joke is um, it's like the, the, the team size shall match the size of two pizzas because two pizzas is all you would need to feed them. Um, honestly, having two high schoolers, sorry, high schooler kids in the past, I don't think two pizzas is an adequate representation of what it would take, but uh, uh, roughly 10 people in a team who, who would have all the um, expertise or will grow the expertise to, to define, to create, to, to test, and to deliver a certain increment of value is basically a certain functionality. A capability. Uh, the team, uh, the way a team is organized, um, typically there are at least two people in specifically in concerto or the in GE. We try to create three leaders for every team, at least in in MR. Uh, one is um, the product owner. The product owner is the person who defines. Um, the requirements, if you wish, who defines the needs for the customer, the customer representative. This person defines the acceptance criteria for the capabilities that will be developed. And this person also tests, does the final acceptance test to, to confirm that the content or the, uh, the capability delivered is indeed matches the expectations. Um, the second person is Scrum Master and um, this person, uh, we can talk about servant leadership, we can talk about uh, the team leader, but the, the primary role of Scrum Master is to observe the team operation, help team visualize the uh, challenges that they face in delivering content and help remove the impediments which are external, whatever the external dependencies they are. And then the, the third person who may be pictured here is the technical lead. Uh, that's heavily dependent on the structure of the team and the goals of the team. But uh, uh, we typically assign like an architect or the technical lead to every Scrum team in uh, in MR. And then you can scale it up and create by creating one team. There is an opportunity to create multiple of those teams. Um, some of them will be cross-functional, meaning having different expertise within the team. Uh, some of them uh, could be enabler teams uh, and being you know, solo focused in a particular area of the system uh, and, and help serve the rest of the um, program or the project team to with whatever deliver, deliverables they, they have. The second pillar is the backlog. Um, the goal is to capture all the elements of work that need to happen. And there are certain uh, concepts that's called user stories, refactors and maintenance stories but the, the bottom line is that the user story defines a certain value, uh, articulates that value, articulates the acceptance criteria for that capability. And uh, once that user story is done, then uh, it's great that the, the robot or whatever the system has that new function, new capability um, in there. Um, those user stories can, I mean, depending on the scale, we can bundle several user stories into a feature and feature into an epic, but this is kind of the default. The, the, once we scale it up, um, it would go there. And then um, the backlog is visualized. It's, it's captured in, in the system, whatever the system is. It's visualized and then you see how these things start moving. You pick up a story from left side uh, you analyze what it actually needs to be done in there, you review it with the team, you build it, you test it, and then the product owner um, accepts it. And then you start moving, you keep moving those stories from left to right through the system um, until everything is done or until you meet your milestone, okay? And then there will be some things that we thought we would do, but it didn't meet the time box, so it's okay. Uh, this third pillar is the the uh, the sprint. 
the iteration and the cadence of it. Um, the motivation, there are several, I'll talk about this a little bit in the next slide of how we organize and what happens during the sprint, but for us, um, it's basically a time box. At the beginning of the time box, the team does the planning. They execute, they meet every day. Um, and then at the end of that uh, time box, at the end of the sprint, uh, there is a sprint review in which the uh, functionality which was delivered in the sprint is demonstrated. Um, and final, final pieces of that are accepted by the product owner. And this is a very important concept. Um, so we, we, we are forcing the demonstration every two weeks, every sprint. And um, it's a very powerful tool uh, in, in assessing where we actually are. And the last piece of every iteration is a retrospective. Uh, the team uh, gets together and talks about what worked, what didn't work, where the impediments were, and then decides what to do about these impediments or these challenges that they faced in the next iteration. They take one or two actions towards the next iteration and then do the planning. And then the whole thing repeats again and again and again, time box after time box. So uh, this shows a little bit of an example of how we actually operate uh, Concerto. So I work in GE, as Tim mentioned, and I work in MR, and Concerto is the name of the program that we are, we're running here. As I said, uh, we're running two-week sprints, OK? And uh, we, we, we take the team, every single team. We have about 20 Scrum teams in Concerto right now. We take every single team through the same ritual every two weeks. We start with planning. They do prepare for it. There is the backlog that's groomed and prepared for the sprint. They do the planning. They meet every day uh, for what's called daily scrum, uh, 15 minutes meeting to, to sync up on what's what was done the previous day, uh, what is in the plan for this day, and um, what help is needed if needed, and, uh, and stuff like that. Uh, and that's where the Scrum Master is essential, kind of facilitating these discussions. Um, the execute, execute daily meetings. At the end, there is a review. Uh, there is demo, uh, which is very important, as I said, retrospective, and resume, restart all over again. Um, we use tools to capture the backlog, and that, uh, that transparency and visibility of the work that is to be done um, by the team and each of the team members is very, very important. Um, at, the, at the end of the planning team basically commits to the deliverables of that sprint. And that means that everybody holding hands and saying, yes, we're gonna do it. We know how to do it and we will do it together, helping each other. So during the sprint, this is how the team board looks like. Every box here represents a user story that the team moves, a team moves from left to right. Okay, the phases of this board are defined uh, by the tool in a way. Uh, you can customize this, of course, but uh, that, that visibility and transparency is, was very, very important uh, for, for, for the team as well as for team of team leaders to be able to see what's happening every, every single day. Uh, some of the key things that help us as well uh, when we deal with user stories, for example, every user story is sized based on the effort and the level of uncertainty with it. Uh, what it allows team to do is to create different visualization of how well we're doing and whether or not doing better sprint to sprint. Uh, for example, um, this view uh, demonstrates the commitment to complete certain amount of work at the beginning of the sprint and then what the team actually committed. Uh, at the end, what got accepted at the end of the sprint. So what we see, for example, that green bar represents, or green area of the chart represents the accepted stuff. The blue represents completed stuff ready for acceptance. So that's, at that point, product owner can take this and, and we, we can look at the yellow uh, part of the graph to look at what's, what's in progress right now and whether or not it's too much stuff is in progress and we're not able to finish any of it. So a very powerful tool that's called cumulative flow diagram. The next chart is uh, um, the next chart is velocity chart. So again, 
the team, because everything is sized, all the work elements, user stories are sized, uh, we can see how the team is doing on the velocity sprint to sprint and bring this back and talk about this with the team to understand um, what was happening, why the, for example, this sprint dropped so much, what the impediments were and how to address them. And you can see that the team got better in the following sprint and recovered a little bit of that lost capacity, the lost velocity, sorry, in the previous one. Uh, this is a typical burn down chart. Uh, it, it's, so what do I see here, for example? In this chart, it's very evident that some amount of work got added in the middle of the sprint. And that could happen because the team realized that they have more capacity in the sprint uh, to pull more work, which is fantastic, or that the work that they committed to deliver became much bigger than what they thought. And that's again gives us and the team the, that understanding and the visualization of where to focus next, uh, what to do to address the challenges they're facing. And um, what we have here, this is the uh, team planning board basically showing um, how much capacity was planned for each of the sprints. Uh, you can see the sprints which are underloaded and the sprints which are overloaded. Uh, so a very powerful tool as well. So this, when we look at the team, there are a ton of practices. There are, there are a lot of practices at the technical level as well. Um, how they develop software, which practices used there, how to continuously integrate software with hardware uh, every sprint, how to test uh, software with hardware every sprint. There are a lot of practices uh, which we can focus on next time, depending on the interests um, you'd have to kind of dig further into this. And then we can look at the team of teams in case the project is bigger. As far as I understand, uh, your team is up to 15 people, right? Yeah. That's a max. Gotcha. Yeah. So maybe a space for two Scrum teams, uh, maybe one very big one, but it's kind of harder to execute in that mode because there are too many people, probably. But if you have a couple teams, you can look at the consolidation of um, kind of how to converge and how to look at this holistically of what was planned and what was delivered and where we are, where we stand. Uh, Scaled Agile Framework gives a lot of information about how to execute uh, uh, at different scale when you have a few Scrum teams in, a, in an activity in a project or something bigger like 20. So there is an essential safe and a large solution and portfolio and so on. And there are different practices that can be emphasized at, at each different level. Um, some of the tools that we're using to to monitor where we stand. Um, this is a community flow diagram at the program level. You could see like sprint by sprint, how things come together uh, from the whole, um, the whole team, the team of teams. Uh, we look at defect trends. Uh, SPRs are like defects and issues that we find. And the goal is to, first of all, to have the green bar or the green line rather uh, be above red. So we, we fix more issues than we find and the, the black line to reflect that as well. So that's, that's an important part when we start talking about the maintenance of the, uh, of the system. Uh, because everything is sized and the backlog items are sized, uh, we can build projections. So what you see here is the projection versus the milestones. So the, the green bars represent um, what got completed in every given iteration. And the lines represent the milestone or the scope that is required for us to meet a particular milestone. So you could see when, like you can, you can see here that the team needs a couple more iterations to reach this orange line, the scope defined by this. Uh, this chart uh, again shows sprint by sprint, how the features are being integrated. Um, what was the original plan? Uh, for the features and how they got integrated de facto at the end of each sprint. Uh, so th there are a lot of tools and visualization we can build to help us determine where we are, okay? So when we talk about Agile, um, there are a lot of misconceptions about Agile in general, but if I were to summarize, Agile may not always help us to go faster, but what it helps us is 
to figure out if we have any problems with achieving our goals much sooner, if that makes sense. Um, so we, we know very early whether or not we're able to hit our goals, to hit our milestone, to deliver to the commitments uh, that were made at the beginning of um, the iteration. There are a few links here which talk about the product delivery, the teams, continuous learning culture, which is very important and a kind of general link to scale agile framework. At your leisure, you can uh, look at this uh, and uh, kind of find a lot of explanation and, and different practices described in detail there. So, hey, good luck in Houston. Uh, it's a phenomenal uh, opportunity. And it's a pretty big meet um, as well, uh, a very big international meet. So uh, good luck, and I uh, hope you are doing. Uh, you will be doing really well there. Okay, fantastic, Sergey. And I think that uh, you know th this is a team that uh, has a, a limited scope and a defined number of people, but lots of flexibility in what we deliver. So I think the uh, safe framework, the agile framework, is really quite interesting for for that work. Good. We really appreciate the overview. If you have a few minutes, I think the team has some questions, if you wouldn't mind us uh, asking I a few things. Please go ahead. Okay. So I'm going to get you started. Um, the concept of doing lots of work and, and adjusting the content of the work. Can you talk a little bit about how user stories are implemented or what a user story is? especially in the context where, you know, we have some of the team building a robot. We have some of the team working on software. We'll have some of the team working on, you know, technical outreach or communication. Can you give a little bit of a flavor of how user stories define work elements and, and how you set up a user story? If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. There is actually a template for how user story is defined. Um, and the template goes, uh, if I remember, the, remember it correctly, it goes as a persona, I want to achieve something so that blah, blah, blah. So for example, in the context of a robot, uh, that would be as a robot. So that's an interesting one because that's where we can differentiate between different groups, right? Outreach, building robot, building software and stuff. The most important part is to think about the customer of that user story. So we're delivering the value, we're delivering functionality to the customer. As a robot, I want to um, shoot the ball with a precision of, I don't know, 10 centimeters, right? Uh, so that I can hit the basket uh, and, and so on, whatever. They, I probably I could probably come up with a better definition or example of a user story, but the template is the same every time. As a user, I want to so that. Okay, so we define the persona, we define what needs to happen, and we define why we want this to happen. And these three elements give a lot of context to the team to determine how to implement that need. And also gives the flexibility to, to look at different personas, at different users in this case, okay. right? Good. So those user stories can be defined to accomplish a portion of any goal, regardless of the goal type, and assign it to team members and watch the progress. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Team, I'll open it up to you. Any, any uh, questions uh, from our team members here? Um, I was wondering, so all the tools you use for like the planning and monitoring like process among projects, do you know like where we could get any of those, like any free tools of that or? Uh, good question. So the tools that uh, we are using called Rally and Jira, and they are not free. I don't know if they have free editions. Okay, so Rally goes as R A L L Y and Jira is J I R A. They may have some free editions, uh, but I think if you um, 
if you look up um, what would that be uh, agile life cycle management tool something like this okay or a scrum team management that type of stuff you will find plenty of boards um, online i'm sure Okay, good. I believe there are some Smartsheet and Excel sort of based tools as well. That might be something could be. we could look at as well. Yep. Good, good question. And if you time. have like a team room, if you have a team room where you go every day, then you actually can create those boards pretty much like on whiteboards, right? In With paper. Notes. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. That's, yeah. That's where we started many years ago before realizing that the scale requires, you know, digital tools. All right, good. Thank you, Matthew. Anyone else? Uh, yeah. So um, I was just wondering, how does Agile change the amount of work output or speed about or, or work output? Great question. I'm thinking uh, how to answer this. This is a very deep one. Um, so there is a... Um, a notion of agile allowing us to go faster, okay? And that's true. That's true because we can be more predictable with the delivery. We are getting more predictable with the delivery using this methodology. How it helps to go faster or deliver more? One, there are a lot of technical practices that I touched on very br briefly, like continuous integration, for example, which are very powerful tools to find the issues early, fix them and move on, okay? Uh, vertical integration and vertical slicing is another very powerful tool which helps us move faster. What that means is our motivation is to, great, to integrate hardware and software together within a time box, within an, a, a one single sprint, one single iteration, okay? It, that's not always easy to do, but that's our goal and that's what we're aspiring for and that's what we're pushing for. So we can have a system running at every given time. Integrate hardware software, run the robot, okay? The other very important tool is automated testing. Doing manual tests and repeating this test. So if you do the integration, you want to make sure that the new functionality is working, but also that the old functionality was not impacted. And the, the best way to do it is to develop test framework along with the functionality, which you can utilize to run the regression all the time, which means that you catch the issues right away as they come, fix them quickly and move on. So, and then there are a lot of other technical practices that, um, that help us move faster and deliver more. On the execution side, I think the transparency of execution is a very powerful tool because the team commits to a certain set of priorities in every sprint. And we request, we, we, together with the team, we create that flat list of priority, which means that the highest priority work item has to be finished first. And when it doesn't, for whatever reason, there is a delay team goes back and together swarms at it to help it move through faster. So they focus on the higher priority items, okay? And we make the trade-offs, we make the decisions to, to remove some of the things from the sprint. I mean, to not complete intentionally some of the items at the bottom so that we can focus on the higher priority uh, work items. Is that, does that answer your question? Enough? Yeah, thank you. Great. You are? You're waving. Yeah, um, I have a question for you. Can I say it? Please go ahead. So you mentioned five to 11 team members. Would you say that this would be the most efficient amount of team members for a team? And if so, then would exceeding 15 team members make a team less efficient? The ideal size of the team is determined by the number of social interactions, effective social interactions within the team to achieve a goal. 
to complete work. Okay, so once the team is too big, there is too much interaction. When you meet for 15 minutes every day for the stand up, team members need to share enough without this meeting growing into half an hour, 45 minutes. So it should be enough people to be able to, to fit all the updates into the 15 minute slot. If I look at how our teams are structured um, in, in Concerto, for example, I would say the average size <clears throat> is about seven to nine people, okay? Once it grows bigger, it becomes harder. It's not impossible. It just becomes harder to manage that interaction within it. So 15 people, if I were just going bl you know, blindly, if somebody would tell me how to organize 15 people, I would create two scrum teams. Okay, good. I think it's an excellent point, Sergey, about the optimum team size comes from where are the natural interactions of the team members. If you're working on like tasks, that's a team and you don't want it so big that the communication gets difficult and, and you don't need to connect people on a team that aren't working together, right? If they're independent, completely independent work, then you don't need to create a larger team just to have a particular size. So it's certainly something for us to think about as a team as we take a, you know, a handful of people and we head off on oftentimes three or four different tasks at the same time. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions for the team? Otherwise I have one for all of you. Uh, yeah, just one more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so the scrum teams, the work that they have, is it uh, built out on an individual level or do they collaborate and work together so that, and on one task so that they get it done faster? Okay. Um, the user story at the sprint planning, the user story is typically decomposed to tasks. And this task could be assigned to one person, or task could be assigned to multiple individuals. It depends. The goal is for one task, kind of generally how we calibrate the team, one task should be completed in one day. So at least it you size it when you define it, you size it so that it can be completed in eight hours. Okay? I mean seven hours, whatever. The motivation is task, you should see the vis visible progress with every task every day, but with the tasks which are in action, which were in progress, right? Those tasks which are in progress, you should be able to see progress every day. There shouldn't be a task which is called in progress and there is no activity on it, okay? So task is done in a day and the user story is definitely done in a sprint. That's kind of the scale that we're giving to the team. Okay, good. And I think that two week kind of sprint is a very natural timing for us, right? If you think about a season that's three or four months long, it's quite good for a Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Swar, did you have one? Okay. I'm going to ask a question to the team and see if you guys have, uh, have any thoughts on it. One of your, uh, excluding, uh, Mr. Korbelnikov here. One of all of your challenges is that we have multiple tasks going on in parallel and it's difficult for the team to know what's happening. So we will get into situations where we might duplicate work. Somebody could do the same thing twice. Uh, I'll give you an example, like uh, produce a, a contact card for, the, for, the, uh, uh, for a competition, for a qualifier. We don't know who's doing it and all of a sudden two people do it uh, independently or Another example of that, where we have trouble keeping track of each other would be uh, someone is working on communications and, and uh, writing documentation about what we're doing. And because they're focused on the documentation, they may not know everything that was going on in the team and they may miss some things, not talk about things that we did do. As you guys look at the scaled agile framework in this methodology, how do you think that might help us here? And what tools do you see that could help us understand the work of the team better? 
I think what it does is um, without like physically talking and interacting, which sometimes is a waste of time or takes up too much time, the the framework kind of allows you to know what others are doing and where they are in their tasks without having to really talk to them. So it allows you to kind of do your own work while you're still working in a team, even if you're not like talking to each other. Okay, Sergey, I'll let you react to that. I, I, uh... um, it's, it's a great point. So, uh, yes, uh, it does. Oh, I'm sorry. We lost our audio there just a bit. No. There you're back. Excellent. Okay, we can hear you now, I think. Okay, we have you back, Sergey, but I think you're muted right now. Okay, I think it switched to the uh, to the laptop. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. So not only that uh, scheduling didn't uh, yeah surprise me, but also the headset uh, died. Okay. Um, so yes, you can move. Uh, and see uh, while while you're working and deep into something, you can see what your teammates are doing and what's happening. The other benefit is, uh, Tim, you mentioned right when two people are doing the same thing, when a user story is assigned to a person, a task is assigned to a person, it's very visible. So that you you minimize the duplications, potential duplications of that also, right? Which is additional benefit. Um, yeah, this, this transparency is a huge tool. Being able to see everything. With that said though, when you collaborate with somebody on one task or one user story, kind of talking to each other is essential too, right? Especially when we talk about aspects which require integration, design of hardware and software together and that type of stuff. That's where we kind of force that um, collaboration by putting people in the same team because the value delivered is the value for the robot, and that includes both hardware and software. And then they kind of, they, they, they meet and talk and, and, and do this work together. Make sense? Good. And I think you all know, um, we have many integration points where many deliverables have to come together for something to work. Uh, you know, the mechanical pieces have to be ready. The software has to be ready. We have to be ready as a team to practice and, and do testing. So. I think it's, you know, we have lots of opportunities, a team where we get together at these integration points. And I think that visibility and, and understanding progress to those integrations are a, a huge benefit of a tool like this too. So good. Any other questions for the team from the team? Excellent. Well, Sergey, thank you very much. You've been a little bit of a prototype. We're reaching out to some some other engineering, uh, uh, some other engineering experts at at GE, talking about reliability design, talking about systems design, in some areas that we don't always have exposure to. But we very much appreciate you uh, helping kick this series of uh, discussions off with us, and and help helping open the door to uh, a really great, uh, willing, and rich set of mentors. Uh, that we have in the technical technical community in the Milwaukee area, uh, so it's been quite nice. So thank you very much. You're more than well more than welcome, Tim. Uh, you know, feel free to reach out to me with any further questions. If anything pops up after the conversation, I'll be more than happy to to share what I know, what we've experienced, and uh, again, good luck in uh, Houston. Awesome. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.